Okay, so this is uh, Laws 12059 Conveyancing, and uh, today we're doing Topic 6, which is the, uh, the second um, instalment, if you like, rather fortuitous to call it instalment, I suppose, um, the second instalment on formation of contract, and it really is looking at issues around in, um, contracts in relation to, well, I mean, the three, three main themes of the topic is the cooling off period and um, how that works. I didn't actually give you a specific tutorial question on that. But I'll just have a little, little chat about it before we get into the two questions because um, a couple of changes there that I just need to bring to your attention. You may already be aware of them, which is, would be good, but I'll just bring them to your attention anyway. So the cooling off period and how that works and why it's there and, and so on. And um, then instalment sales of land or instalment contracts for purchases uh, and how they work in, in, in contrast to the standard conveyance where the person um, you know, signs the contract at the beginning of the period, pays the deposit um, and, and process starts from that point. And how, how does that work differently in the context of instalment contracts? And that's covered um, by tutorial 11, uh, problem 11. And then the, um, the, la the other major theme in uh, the topic, uh, which is covered by tutorial problem 12, and that's the deposit. How does that work? Um, what is it? But importantly, you know, how can it be paid? And that's what the question focuses on options with regard to, to payment. Just a couple of points um, by way of, you know, and I've already um, given you some feedback on your responses posted to Moodle. Um, just a couple of general points. Please always remember that where a question is framed in the context of providing advice, which it often is, to a party or to more than one party, then that's what you need to do. You need to actually frame your response as an advice to the, to the party that you're being asked to advise. It isn't just an objective discussion, um, as if it were an open-ended question or just a, a question put to you in a sort of like an academic situation. You know, in law, we're very much about application. It's an applied... Um, uh, understanding and most of the testing the assessment is has an application focus it's not just about explaining the legal framework but it's in a context um, very typically of course problem solving oriented but not always so you need to make sure you advise the client if and whoever that client is and what and and, and understand particularly in this context understand what side of the transaction they're on are they a seller are they a buyer is it a commercial situation? Is it a, um, a residential situation? Uh, if it's in relation to standard form contract, which one is the relevant one? Um, does there need to be changes or modification? But in the context of advising the client, okay, um, that's that's uh, very important. And um, just I want to say, I want to say one other thing. Um, uh, oh, just remember that you know when when you're when you're examining the law, then also one needs to think practically and pragmatically about that. In terms of well, why is the client asking me these these questions? Okay, and then sorry, there was another point I wanted to, wanted to make with regard to advice is that sometimes very challenging. I mean, and, you know, we're simulating scenarios for you and so forth to try and replicate situations that you might experience in, 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 out there in, in practice land, if you like, in whatever context. But clients come to you, right, and very typically, I could say not atypically, I suppose, it would be a good, good lawyer speak, but not atypically. <laughs> I'll be more direct and say very typically. Um, they actually, in truth... They sort of want you to make the decision for them because they think you've got, you're, the, you're the one with the knowledge, you're the one with the experience, you're the one with the know-how. Come on, you, you, you sort of help me along here and, and 
you know, what, 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 what should I do? Not in terms of just, you know, what, what, what advice do you give me in terms of the law, but come on, what, what would you do, basically? Right? Now, there's a very fine line here between the fact that as a legal practitioner, in whatever capacity and in whatever context, your role is to advise. Yes, that's no, 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 doubt, no issue about that. Your, your role is never, I have to emphasise this strongly, is never to make the commercial decision for the client. That's the client's job. You know, let's talk about, you know, job allocations here, right? <laughs> we work in an organisation, there's the job allocations, right? The client needs to know what their job is and they need to appreciate what your role is. Okay. Having said that, right, having said that, it's very important for you to, to grasp in an increasing way, because, you know, most of you are not, you're not at the end of your, your, your degree yet. Okay, I fully appreciate that. But you, as you proceed through your courses, it's very important in my view, and particularly a course like this that is very practical and very applied, to remember that your client needs practical advice. Your client doesn't need to just know about what the law is or what the section of the legislation says, but they need that to be crafted in a practical context. Also remember, right, and this is a little, this is a bit, a bit tricky, maybe. Um, in communication, as professionals, we, we, we operate in different gears. You know, it's a bit like... Um, first, second, third gear of a motor vehicle, I suppose. Drive an automatic, all just done for you. But I don't drive automatics, I drive manuals because I like to move through the gears, right? And be in control that way. And in communications with different groups, different audiences, as, as a legal professional, you've got to change gears. So if, for example, and this is quite conceivable, right? You could be given a scenario that says that you, you need to advise a colleague or a partner in a firm, the way you would frame that discussion, the way you would frame the response, the way you would frame what you say is not the same as the way you would frame what you say to a client. Client wants things presented to them in very practical terms. They do want to appreciate the law and what's going on and they do want to be able to see that you know what's going on, that you're competent, but they do want to see things explained in very practical terms and the law put them that way. So in the context of you know, academic courses, that has to be adjusted a bit, but I am looking to see that you have an understanding of that. Has anyone got any comment on any of that? Uh, no, no comment on that, Michael, but um, I do have a question, actually. Just turn your sound up a little bit, Lisa. Is that better? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah, it's good, it's good. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I've just... I've just got a quick question about the echoes. I was having a look at them this morning. Is there no echo four? Because it, te it jumped from three to five. Three was loaded twice, and then there was five, yeah. but there's yeah. no four. Is that right? That's there hasn't. There's not a four at this stage, um, and I've been had a, I had a few technical issues with the uploading of the echo recordings, um, and I've tried. To, I think I've sorted that out now with the IT people, um, and I didn't do one for four at this stage, but I'm happy to do one for four because um, I did a fairly with. Um, uh, I think it was before, I'm just, I'm just losing track now with conveyancing as opposed to, um, um, topic four was, did we do, this is topic six, we did, um, what was topic, topic four was, seller disclosure, all right, I'll just go back and check that, um, yeah, okay, I'll go back and check that, um, there was, I just, I might have been confusing this landlord, but um, yeah, okay. But thanks for that. And I'll go back and check those echo recordings. But, they, they ha, but there has been a bit of technical issue with regard to uploading those recordings. Um, have you found the recordings useful? Yes, I have actually. But they just cement all the information. Yeah. I found very yeah. useful. Yeah. I just on, 
just on that, on the actual recordings, I've taken a different view to um, the way other people do things, I suppose, with regard to those recordings. I think I'm using different technology to what others are using. Others are using Camtasia. I'm not using that. I've also decided not to just have you look at PowerPoint slides and me talking in the background. I actually think it's preferable to have me there talking with you as a, it's a conversation and you can access the PowerPoint slides uh, as needs be. And the other thing is the slides, I mean, when I talk and present something, if I, was, if I, if I had you in a classroom, I would certainly not be going dum de dum de dum de dum de dum through a set of slides. Um, and I've seen other recordings and with all due respect, I actually think that approach is a bit stilted and um, that's my own view, it's a personal view. And so that's the reason I've taken the, 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 view, the way of doing it that I have. Um, but I'm happy to have feedback from people about that. Very happy because this is an evolving and, you know, um, I'm learning and, and I want to adjust and improve as I go in terms of that, those online recordings. But one of the things that, that just to just finish on that with regard to that aspect, um, I, I really believe it's very important to somehow one has to find a way to bring in the, the, the spark of energy and the spark of interest and dynamism into those recordings for students, just as you would within the classroom. And uh, for me, just putting up PowerPoint slides and having my voice rumble through these slides in the background doesn't cut it. Um, I don't think, I don't know what other people think, but uh, that's for me, okay? So, um, but I'm happy to have people's feedback on, on that and how it's working or whatever, yeah. All right. Um, any other comments before we progress? No? Okay. Um, all right. So just before we get into the tutorial problems, I just want to go back to um, that first theme, which is not in the problems, but the cooling off period. What? Uh, um, there's two things I want to bring up here. First of all is just for, for a couple of minutes, open up, what, you know, what, 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 what are your thoughts? I mean, we know what the cooling off period is. Uh, what are your thoughts of the concept of a cooling off period in a, a land contract or a conveyance? I'll jump in. Um, I think the, the cooling off period is very much an architect of or part of the architecture of the consumer protection that's inherent in the ACL and the move to uh, with legislators trying to protect consumers. Um, and in an environment where there is such an, ex for, certainly for residential pur um, purchases, where it's such an expensive investment that people buying impulsively in the heat of the moment, under pressure from real estate agents and things like that, that sometimes the detail can get lost up front. And I think it's a great thing that it gives that just a few days to let reality sort of sink in as to sort of what the person's doing and is that genuinely what they're accepting and that's sort of what they want to go ahead with. Yeah, that's, uh, that's good. Anyone else? David? Uh, yeah, look, I, th I think it's important to have that bit of time especially since it is such a big, a big thing to be buying a house and, you know, just to have that, that little bit of time just to clear thoughts and, and yeah, definitely make sure it is something that you want to go through with. All right. Um, next question I've got is the lawyers or the legal practitioner's role in the, con in, in, um, in, in, in the, uh, the context of the cooling off um, aspect of the transaction. What what comments on that? Uh, do you mean um, the, the waiving the cooling off period on behalf of the client? Sorry, is that what you're talking about? You, you because can, um, you, you I don't. Address um, that. You can address that. Um, because uh, I don't know why you would um, advise um, people to waive that cooling off period. There's um, usually a lot of 
money at stake and I, and I agree with Grant. I think um, most people um, need a few days to think about uh, the reality of what they've, what they've done, whether they've been pressured into the sale or, or changed their mind or it was a, something of the spur of the moment. Yeah. What about what about uh, a client in the situation like with Quiz One, where they want a quick quick sale or sorry quick quick purchase, very keen on the property, um, been out had a look at it, um, very insistent client about the speed in which things should take place. What do we do there? I just think if if that's what the client wants, then. Obviously, as um, they're directing you to what you have, what they'd like you to do, then it's probably an option. But I think also um, under the the Property Occupations Act, the uh, the lawyer certificate, when that actually comes into effect, um, will no longer exist. So then the the client has um, the ability to do that themselves. From my understanding, if if that's correct, that's absolutely right, David. Thank you for pointing that out. I just. Um, that's part of what you know that aspect of the question is about um, so basically people you need to be aware that um, uh, the cooling off period will now be dealt with in sections 165 166 and 167 of the property occupations act 2014 I mean it's primarily dealt with in 166 and 167 and 167 goes back to Lisa's point about the the waiving of that period um, Sub uh, 165 subsection 2 um, also refers uh, to the cooling off period. It's not the provision that deals specifically with it, but it refers to it in the context of the buyer um, getting independent property valuation uh, advice um, with regard to the cooling off rights and so forth. Again, getting back to Grant's point, this is about, you know, uh, fine tuning, if you like, of, of the consumer protection provisions in this way. And then coming back to David's point, um, quite correctly, that we need to be aware that, um, for example, if you've got, or you just make a note somewhere, there's a reference there on page eight of the notes, and, and of course the law has been changing <laughs> very, very rapidly in this area. Um, so just make a note of the fact that that discussion there on page eight of the notes before the discussion of instalment sales of land refers to the lawyer's certificate with regard to the cooling off period. Now under um, under the um, Property Occupations Act 2014 that's no longer required and uh, I've actually just today I've uploaded a couple of more links for you onto the website and you'll see under this topic that I've given you uh, two further links, one from the Office of Fair Trading, I think it's the Department of Fair Trading in Queensland that explains the effect of that, just briefly. And then there's also something that I came across which I thought might be useful from Alan's Linklater's um, law firm, um, also talking about some of the impact for clients, obviously from their point of view, um, more of an interest with commercial clients but um, it does helpfully explain the, the impact of that. But, um, and I think David in, intimated this, um, that again, we must remember, this is where we're in this tricky situation at the moment. Um, so that, for example, if you're out in practice at the moment, you're in a very tricky situation because on the one hand, you've got this new act, but it's not yet proclaimed. So it's not actually legally, um, legally um, in, um, it's not the, it's not the legal not the legal framework at the minute but it's virtually there as it were right um, but it's not there yet so we're still operating under PAMDA for the time being so the requirements of PAMDA are still relevant until this becomes proclaimed and then becomes the, the legal framework so really um, and I know you've done a I gave you <laughs> deliberately did this gave, gave you a question in quiz one. Um, to get you to talk a little bit about um, Property Occupations Act and, and just in, in a brief way. And part of the purpose of that was to get you to have a look through it, to think about it and reflect upon, um, you know, it, it, how, it's a, how it's a bit different to 
PAMDA and what was trying to be achieved there to, to, to create to create awareness and understanding by you. But we're in that situation at the moment where PAMDA is still the law, but we have this new act, but not yet proclaimed. So just be aware of where there are these issues that arise, but remember that the framework of PAMDA um, is still the law just for the moment. Yeah, I mean, um, cooling off periods, um, they weren't always around. Uh, <laughs> when I was in practice many years ago, they, 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 weren't, they weren't legislated. Um, and you're quite right, Grant's point about consumer protection. Um, they even came in, actually, they were there prior to the, the advent of the uh, ACL. Um, and, and really, you know, what was it about? It, it, the, the, cooling off, the cooling off period came about, really, because of a process called gazumping. And gazumping, you may or may not be aware of that, but gazumping is basically where purchasers are jumping over the top of each other to get a property within hot, so-called hot property markets um, in you know, big capital cities in Australia, in Australian context. Um, and, you know, people having this opportunity to think about things um, a bit before they launch in. And, um, yeah, but, um, we should, you know, they're here to stay and uh, they do have that consumer protection focus. All right, um, let's move on to um, problem question 11, which dealing, deals with the um, um, uh, instalment sale of land contract and the impact of section 75 of the PLA. We'd like to have a go at problem 11. Well, you've all provided an answer, a response on Moodle, so I suspect you're all in a position to have a go, or have a start. You're all, you're all able to, to come up to the barrier. <laughs> all right, I'll, um, my answer, my Moodle answer was obviously brief, but that I thought the implications of the section was relatively limited in terms of what it was really getting at. Mm. Um, for me, just understanding, or obviously my understanding of an instalment contract is that if somebody is not um, paying the vendor a deposit with the view to either through mortgage or to pay the balance of the purchase price, it's an agreement to pay instalments to the vendor. The vendor still retains the title to the property um, and the purchaser only has an equitable interest in terms of whilst they're making those instalment payments. So that's, that's, that, the, that's the point that differentiates the instalment um, sale of land situation to the regular um, uh, sale of land conveyance, if we can call it like that, where the, the type of interest that's being acquired by the purchaser and the time at which that's acquired is different. And the, the conveyance or the transfer of the interest um, and the rights um, are different. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, um, do you want to continue, Grant? Well, I was just going to say that from, from my perspective when looking at it, the um, Section 75 really is a statutory mechanism to give the purchaser again as a, as a protective measure to give them a right to secure the title to the property. So once they have paid one third of the value of the property in those instalments, they have a statutory right that is you know, backed up to, to pursue title or have, have, their, have their interest registered. Mm. Well, is that, yeah, to the, in relation to um, initiating the conveyance do you think that, uh, any, David or Lisa, you can come in on this, do you think that figure of um, 33%, is that entirely arbitrary or 
how do we settle upon that? Uh, isn't it if they pay um, more, if they've paid more than a third of the purchase price, that they can uh, request the conveyance of the property to them? Yeah, that's that's the that's the trigger. Okay, in terms of the amount of um, uh, value that's being transferred or, or you know, um, transferred to the the vendor or to the, the seller, but what I'm asking is, is that figure? Is that just an arbitrary figure, do you think, or is there any, any um, rhyme and reason for for thirty three percent? Is there a historical background as to why that provision was enacted? I've certainly not, not looked at it in that sort of detail, but is there some history as to how that came about? Um, not, the, not, not as far as I'm aware in terms of impacting upon this aspect. Um, you know, I just think that that's, I don't think there's any, you know, I'm just tossing that up, not <laughs> trying to be tricky here, but um, the, I think that's just a fairly arbitrary figure uh, in terms of the amount of value that's been um, given by the purchaser to the, the seller or the vendor. Um, but um, notice that in this context where the buyer has this right to require a conveyance, then there are also um, associated rights uh, in the seller as well or the vendor. What, what are they? David, do you want to chime in at this point? Anyone want to chime in? <laughs> Doesn't it just give the uh, the seller the right as well uh, that once a third has been paid towards the value of the property that they can instigate the conveyance as well and that they can require that the purchaser either through mortgage or pays the balance or something of the sort. Yeah, well, that's and right. That's right. And, the, you know, this uh, it goes back to, um, this is discussed sort of on about, oh, about page 12, 13 of my notes. Um the idea where um, once the buyer has the right to have the property conveyed by the seller, this is conditional on a mortgage in favour of the seller or as directed by the seller for the balance of the monies owing under the instalment contract. Okay. So um, that's a right that the seller has. Now, this is a point that, that all of you, including Tishan, who's not with us, um, unable to, to come to the classes because of work permits, but... Um, I don't think anyone picked up on the point about, and I, and I pointed out to a few of you, is that the issue that crops up with regard, for example, to Section 75, Subsection 3 of the PLA, and it goes to the issue with regard to costs associated with this process. So, for example, back on pages 12 to 13, I say that the, the seller is also accorded a correlative right of conveyance and mortgage, but as noted, Section 75.3 causes some difficulty. Basically, the seller is required to bear the costs associated with the conveyance and in relation to the preparation and registration of the mortgage, provided these advances are added to the principal sum secured by the mortgage. The problem is that the buyer may object to those advances being added to the principal secured by the original mortgage. In addition to that, um, this division of the Property Law Act can't be contracted out of. So the sticking point here is the agreement by the buyer to have the costs associated with this process added to the principal amount. Um, 
And that can cause, that can give rise to dispute actually between the parties. Now, the, the issue that we really need to be concerned about is that um, as a legal practitioner, right, you could be acting for either party in this type of a transaction. Right? And it's very important for you to be advising the party that you're acting for, you know, of the, of the full array of their, their rights and entitlements, but also what are these issues that can come back at them from the other side. But the other point is I was getting is the, 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 the focus that I was trying to emphasise at the beginning of um, today's class is that this idea of a very practical or a very pragmatic approach, and that is despite the, the legality, despite the legal requirements here, um, what do the parties actually want? What does your client actually want? Do they want this transaction to proceed? Do they want um, to... to sell the property or buy the property, ultimately the answer to that question mostly would be yes. So um, they have to navigate their way through this. But um, one of the things to remember is that sometimes the legality of process can be used as a, a, a leverage point with regard to bargaining and, and negotiation between the parties in terms of what happens and what doesn't happen and so on and so forth. So the role of the legal practitioner here, um, firstly, is certainly need to make sure your client, depending on what side of the transaction you're, you're working on and advising, um, is aware of you know, the legal uh, requirements and what, what the, the, the law um, expects. But you need to be mindful of what the client is trying to achieve here and the parameters within which they're working. No client will appreciate um, just being given legal advice that doesn't have a context of practical understanding about you know, what they're trying to achieve and what they want at the end of the day and, and time frames and so forth that they want to work within. This also goes back to the point we made a bit earlier, just you know, with regard to... Um, cooling off periods and so on um, in a different context. But the fact that you know, clients can come to you sometimes very demanding and uh, sometimes unrealistic expectations, um, you, you have to navigate them through um, the legal context but also work a bit with, you know, what practically or commercially they're trying to achieve. Michael? Yeah, yeah, Grant, yeah. Um, just, I'm either going to expose my sort of misunderstanding or I'm not sure what's going to happen, but when you're in the context of giving advice, if somebody is going to, if a seller is going to enter into an instalment contract, no doubt there would be advice obtained from a solicitor at the time as to what that means, what are the consequences of entering into an instalment contract. Mm. And would I be right in saying that based on Section um, 75.3, that at the time of contracting, would the advice be that um, if you wish to basically force the purchaser to proceed with the conveyance, then you are going to have to pony up the, uh, the duties and taxes. You can add it to the overall price. But you will have to, if you want to instigate it, you're going to have to pony up that to start with um, to force them to complete. Is that something that would be discussed? One, is that correct what I'm saying there? And two, is that something that should be explained at the time of the initial um, contract of sale so that they're aware of that going into it? Correct in terms of that's the practical consequence. As to should it be discussed up front, let me toss it back to... Lisa and David, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, I, I would say that it would have to be important to be discussed up front so that you know what your position is as a, as a purchaser. Yes, I would say the same, that it would probably be best to discuss it up front. People, uh, clients, are unusual creatures sometimes. And um, I always took the view 
and, do, and continue to take the view in dealings with, with all um, clients or prospective clients in whatever context I'm, I'm functioning in, um, that um, they appreciate, I think at the end of the day, they appreciate robust advice. You might have to tell them some things that they don't want to hear. You might have to inform them about some challenges and some hurdles in terms of how this transaction is going to run its course. You might actually, um, at, at, at a point, and it may well be best done up front, is that this is not the best way to achieve what you want to achieve, and there are other ways to do this. They certainly will appreciate advice that provides options and alternatives that assists them to achieve their commercial objective or business objective or personal objective. And we're talking about a, in the purchase of a, a say residential, residential lot, for example. But um, that, that does that in a way that makes them aware of the things that they're going to have to bear the burden of as well. And, and of course, you know, people being people, the, the two ingredients usually that are of most interest to them is time and money. They want things to be done as expeditiously as possible and they want things to be done as cheaply as possible. That's sometimes a bit challenging because the law takes its time about things sometimes and um, a transaction, of course, mostly runs its course as well. Um, and there are you know, cost factors involved in, in the process, not only in terms of you know, your, your work, but, but also you know, other, other matters and so on. So, um, no, I mean, I think that the client appreciates upfront advice about those sorts of things. Um, and yes, uh, what you've hinted at, Grant, are, is, is accurate in terms of the practical effects and consequences. And we always need to have an eye, Grant, yeah? um, There's a part two to that question, actually. Part two. Because then, <laughs> I'm waiting for part two. <laughs> the part two is because under 75.3, um, shall so must uh, that they are that the the vendor is obliged to um, to provide for those duties. Yep. Can that be contracted out of? I I couldn't sort of grasp whether. No, no, um, yes, no. You can't contract out of that yep. part of PLA. Now there's the rub. Okay. Okay, there's the sticking point, and yep. I make that point. I'll just take you to where I make it in the notes for you, so you can make a highlight of it or whatever. Um, so top of page 13, or anyway, it's just before the section on restrictions on the rights of the seller. So division four of the PLA cannot be contracted out of, okay? And uh, we know that there are some, some types of law legislation which can be contracted out of and some that can't. This is this this dance that happens between the, the, the laws that come from the parliament on the one hand and what the parties themselves are determining by their own agreement on the other. And remember at the beginning of this course, we said that in this area, of course, we've got those three frameworks that are working with each other. We've got the legislation, we've got the body of case law, but most critically, we've got the contract itself, contract of sale, okay, this is an instalment contract. Um, and what the parties maybe want to do through their contract may not always be permitted according to law. So we have to understand this, you know, these, these requirements. And that's and that part of, because you can't contract out of it and because of these um, tricky bits with regard to the costs associated with the um, carrying out of the rights in this way, um, yeah, it becomes, becomes a little bit, a little bit um, possibly contentious if the parties, the vendor and the, and the purchaser can't um, agree to the, the, the bearing the burden of these costs. And, and that's basically, I mean, the question was intended to tease out um, the uh, your understanding of, of this different nature of the um, instalment contract 
um, the buyer's rights in relation to that type of a, um, a contract of sale um, and the impact of the Property Law Act through Section uh, 75 and aspects and dimensions of that. All right, good. Um, let's uh, turn our attention then to um, problem 12. And problem 12 takes us um, into the direction of the deposit. And uh, the deposit, of course, is a critical piece of the puzzle, um, reflecting your, your seriousness of intention and, and so on and so forth. But the question is focusing on options, not uh, not not uh, options in a, in, a, in a conveyancing sense, which we'll look at a bit later. Options to purchase and so on. We'll get in the last topic, of course. But just uh, choices and options here with regard to um, the deposit. Um, so, who'd like to have a go at um, starting our discussion on that? Okay, well, I'll, I'll start it off. Uh, the, um, the alternatives that I had down for the deposit were cash, deposit, bond or bank guarantee. Uh, and uh, I said that if the market conditions were strong, a deposit bond or a guarantee is preferable because it is gives the, the uh, stakeholder... Is, a is the client actually asking you for all of those, uh, all of those options? Yeah, it's true, they are, uh, those options are correct, but what is the client focusing on? Are the alternatives for paying the deposit. All of the alternatives? Uh, just let me grab the question. Yeah, go okay, back, that's fine, I love the question. David? I think it was just alternatives to, to using a, a, um, a bank guarantee. Exactly. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. So this is a this is the point I was getting to earlier, right? Read the question carefully because it's it's you know this is a simulated exercise in a sense of what you'd be doing in reality, right? The client comes to you and asks you for advice about something, options and mentions of something in particular. That's what they want you to give them advice on. They don't want you to necessarily go through every all of the available things. I mean, they may have discounted those themselves. You have to exercise your judgment about, um, you know, whether you think that you need to discuss other other options or other alternatives, um, or whether you just focus on fo focus in on what the client has actually identified. Um, what, what just open up to the three of you? What what's your thoughts about that? You know, do you just focus in on what the client's identified, or do you? You broaden out your advice when you know there are other available alternatives or options. I think there's a duty to the client that if you know that there is a better option or you believe that something would be beneficial to them, that you don't tell them to do it, but you, you provide them some guidance about it so that they can make an informed decision as to whether they consider it. But if you believe it's going to be in their interest, I think it would be sort of diligent to, to at least tell them or and, make them aware of it. And is that, is that, uh, do you, do you uh, proceed on the, on this differently uh, as to whether you're dealing with individuals, uh, say, um, pursuing a residential purchase as opposed to commercial client? Does that make a difference? Absolutely, I think it does. In what way? In what way? Um, a residential purchaser has a lot more to lose. They don't necessarily have cash reserves. Um, the, the risk of an individual being taken advantage of in a transaction as opposed to a corporate entity uh, who have significant resources behind them and experience in these type of things. Um, I think that there is a greater duty of care to an to a 
individual in a residential purchase than in a commercial purchase. Of course, a commercial client can be both the corner shop around the corner and it can also be, that is a small business, and it can also be a large commercial enterprise. Right? So just the fact that it's commercial, um, you know, it makes a difference, yes, but we need to also be aware of the context of our client. And one of the points that I think comes up as well is that um, commercial clients really don't, you know, they don't, they don't, they're not coming to you for shopping list of advice. They're often coming to you for very specific advice about something because they know time is money, it's expensive to come and talk with you. Um, they've got a range, you've mentioned a range of resourcing within their organisation, whatever. So they're coming to you because you have expertise in something and um, they want specific advice about what it is they've indicated. So that needs to be borne in mind, I think, um, when one's differentiating. Of course, in this case, we've got an individual person. Um, I'll just go back to you, Lisa. Um, do you, in, this, in the context of this particular person, so Jasper has asked about the bank guarantee, but then, you know, the question says advise Jasper about the alternatives. How, what, what do you think the best strategy here is then, in terms of what, the, the different approaches we've just been discussing? Well, I think the, um, the primary focus of the advice would be on the alternative, uh, which is the cash or the deposit bond, but um, probably also explain the, uh, the difference between deciding between a deposit bond and a bank guarantee. It would really depend on... Uh, on the client and their, their knowledge already. Yeah. Is it, or do you think that, I mean, how many, how many, this is an individual person, right? right? How many individuals are going to walk into your office, say, you know, wanting to pursue a, um, a residential purchase and start talking about bank guarantees as opposed to the normal way of, of paying? The fact that the, what I'm getting at is the fact the client's raised it, does that suggest something about the client? Well, in the, yes. is the question for an, uh, a yet to be developed lot? In which case, if it's for a yet to be developed lot, then a bank guarantee does have significant advantages because if it's going to take a year to be built, rather than you paying a deposit, that you either can't invest or an interest on or whatever, this gets starts getting into financial advice, then you pay for the bank guarantee, but at least you're not tying up your funds for a year or more. Yep. Um, that, I think, in the context of an undeveloped lot, even for a private individual, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, I mean, look, let's get real here, right? I mean, uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's good. Um, uh, and I think that, that practical... Situ, you know, context of what's happening in terms of the transaction that, that partly influences how you respond. But, um, you know, are we making assumptions here about why this, why, why, why these, you know, Jasper and his partner, why they're, they're purchasing this lot in terms of giving them advice about how to pay the deposit? Are we also making assumptions about why they're purchasing it? What, what's the objective? Aren't there reasons for purchasing immaterial? I don't. I don't think that's the advice of a solicitor to to try and understand what their motivation is in in purchasing. Um, if they're looking for advice, they've specifically heard that you know for this type of thing that bank guarantees are something that's used. Then, to me, the advice should be relating to what they want to know. Yes, if you see that they're walking themselves into a minefield, that you might get them to consider further advice, but otherwise aren't we meant to be telling them not what they want to hear, but the consequences of what it is that they're asking or, or what it is that they're looking to do. What are the two basic options that we've, we've got here in terms of why they'd be purchasing? 
Oh, either to live in themselves or for an investment. Mm. And that, knowing that or getting that information from the client, is, is that not something that's useful and, and a part of the process and, and, would, and would have a... Well, I think, you'd, I think you'd, you'd, during the course of the interview, that would probably come up. You'd probably ask them why, why they were purchasing it. And would the nature of what you'd be saying and the advice you'd be given, would that you know, be, be affected by that understanding? In the context of this particular scenario, I don't think so in the sense that um, whether they're buying it as an investment or whether they're buying it to live in, we're talking about something that may not be built for 12 months or more. So the, the benefit of that bank guarantee is going to apply irrespective of whether it's an investment or, a, or something they want to live in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's all right. That's good. Uh, we'll get to Section 23 in a minute and we'll get to some of the risks with regard to the bank guarantee in a minute. But um, with regard to just advising about how to pay the deposit, and, and the context of the fact that we've got something that's not already in existence but is, is being, being developed in a new block. Um, what you said before, Grant, that's entirely appropriate in terms of thinking about the utility of the bank guarantee as a, um, as a way of um, paying the deposit. Um, however, the point I wanted to bring out, tease out, was that the interesting thing is that People do take a different view about whether they're purchasing for the purposes of occupation and thus becoming an owner-occupier or purchasing for the purposes of investment and thus becoming ultimately, one, one probably would, would imagine, um, a landlord, you know, an owner slash landlord. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is that all owners of property have responsibilities as owners. But the further interesting aspect is that um, owner-occupiers seem to take often a greater concern in, in their ownership and, and what that entails and what that entitles them to than owner-landlords do. Um, but um, anyway, that's, uh, that's sort of uh, not, it's not, not entirely upfront, but it's a it's a, an interesting, I think it's just in terms of, doesn't matter what context of, of ownership that's being acquired here, then, uh, you know, the client needs to appreciate what, what that brings with it um, at the end of the day. I mean, the very fact that, you know, it's a, bit, it's a bit moot in the sense of not knowing here because I've put in some information there, you know, the sweeping views of the Brisbane River, you know, that could either be that, that's something that's appreciated to, to, as a context, um, aesthetically pleasing to live in, or it could be very a very commercial decision that that's going to enhance the value of the property and and therefore in, in, in enhance its value at the end of the day, um, respectively with regard to resale or or even uh, in terms of um, what sort of rent could, it could attract. Um, all right, so. Um, what about the challenges or the problems with the bank guarantee and also the implications of Section 23 of the Land Sales Act? David, what do you think? Uh, just from <clears throat> from reading uh, through the text and stuff, it seemed that the um, the bank guarantee is not a, a standard condition in a in a contract. So obviously that raises some issues that would have to be discussed and and sorted through as well. Is it especially is since Section Twenty Three provides that the uh, any monies that would to be paid would go um, being held by the, the public trustee. 
Yeah, yeah. Is uh, is the um, is it is it? Uh, I mean, Grant's mentioned before about the utility of this option in this situation, but is it is it risky? Anyone, anyone can respond to that. <laughs> yes, um, yes, there is risk. Oh, do you want to jump in, Lisa? Sure, okay. Um, the risk uh, that I can see is that... We have, we have detente here at the moment, detente. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that um, should a, a dispute arise, um, the buyer can be forced to seek injunctive relief to prevent the seller from calling up the guarantee. And also the other point I, I made was that uh, time can be an issue with the guarantee because uh, the banks often want to do uh, property valuations. So it just depends whether um, time is a constraint in, uh, in Jasper's situation. Yep, yep, that's good, that's good. Grant? My response was quite similar to Lisa, actually, in regarding the injunctive relief. Um, although what I wasn't clear on, and this is where I do have a question, I tried to find the case of prior to understand how you could contract out of this when, with the legislation, it's not just the public trustee because it can be held in a trust account by the um, public trustee or with agreement with um, the real estate agent or a solicitor, etc., but you're talking about to be, for money to be held in a trust account, there has to be money. A bank guarantee is a guarantee to pay money. It is not money that you can then sort of put into a trust account. Mm. So if the legislation requires the money to go into a trust account, other than the textbook saying, as per the case of prior, that there is a way that you can implement a contractual term, I couldn't see anywhere or find anything to explain to me how you contract out of that and how that's permissible to do. No, that's, um, that's a good point. Um, uh, yeah, I, did, I think, I mean, uh, I might take that on board, I think, and maybe have a little bit more of a look at that um, and give you a bit of follow-up if I can. Um, but, um, yeah, no, it's a... That point's well made, Grant. Um, it challenges for sure, and in terms of how it actually works, in terms of the contracting out process. Um, can I just... Uh, you said originally that given the factual situ situation, um, you would advise the client this is a good option. Um, are you still... Are you still erring in that direction? Or are you now, in light of the latter part of the question, suggest maybe, the, maybe not suggesting the client pursue this, op, this method for um, paying the deposit? I had the latter part of the question in mind when I was thinking that it was a good thing anyway. So I, I think I'm, lo I'm looking at it purely from a financial viewpoint that yes, there is risk, but then likewise, I and this this again, I did not get this from the text. Um, I can't really see why there would be any difference in relying on a third party um, with a bank guarantee where, yes, you may have to get injunctive relief, but likewise, if it's held in a trust account, you may have to seek injunctive relief in the case of a dispute or some sort of court resolution anyway. So I'm not even sure, other than the textbook saying that it's a disadvantage or a potential risk, I can't actually see how that's the case because even if they they pay the money up front and it's held in a trust account, how does that protect them? I don't I, that I don't get. The 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 other aspect too of this is I think to some degree, you know, there's a bit of reluctance here to accept you know, we can have other options here. I think, you know, it's funny, it's a funny thing really I mean, to say this, but um, that the truth of the matter is that the conventional way of paying the deposit is 
most accepted and most trusted. There are other ways of paying the deposit and meeting that um, obligation, um, but sometimes they, they seem to be less trusted. It's a bit like, you know, show me the colour of your money in a sense, you know. Um, and uh, the other issue that I just put out there is that uh, um, sometimes within particular cultural groups, this presents uh, as an issue too, in terms of the way this can take place. So not only do we have the issue between residential transactions and commercial transactions, by the way, when we talk about residential transactions, um, we need to think about, we can talk obviously about a residential purchase, but is the client purchasing for residential purposes or for commercial purposes? Um, and then we can have a contract which is a residential contract as opposed to a commercial contract, depending on. So there's different aspects of differentiation there between you know personal and commercial, or residential and commercial, and so forth. But um, there's also this idea that um, not only a difference between individual clients and commercial or business clients, but also um, just the practices and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable in, in different community um, situations. I remember, for example, when I was in practice, and it came back a fair few years now, but I used to have some clients that, you know, this is, we're in a different phase of technology and so on and accept that. But this is, I'm absolutely sure this is still the case, that um, some clients would do nothing and would transact on nothing but um, in cash or bank check. There were no other options. And <laughs> I can tell you that this was both in, in individual or, or, or personal circumstances involving legal matters, as well as business and commercial um, transactions involving uh, said clients and um, it's just amazing really I mean I even remember um, putting on my putting on my anecdotal hat now um, you know where I had a few clients where you'd be doing work for them or there'd be requirements for funds and um, um, you know brown paper bags of of, of notes would materialise in terms of, and you know, it wasn't that they, you know, this was you know, not money that was not correct or anything, but they just, the, the transactions in cash was the way that they, they did things, you know, that was how it happened. Um, now that doesn't, you know, the, the, the nature of this question is not directly um, targeted towards that, but there are aspects here of, you know, with, practice of law, particularly I think in conveyancing transactions, where sometimes habits and ways of doing things well established. Um, but we are in a different epoch now and we are in the electronic age and increasingly um, transactions of this nature will be, you know, within the full embrace of technology and um, the electronic um, facility, uh, both with regard to the documentation and with regard to the, the funding process. And this raises other issues about um, speed, and as we've seen previously, um, about convenience, but on the other hand, challenges. Challenges uh, both from the side of, from the documentary side, and also um, in terms of other aspects of the transaction, including finance. All right. Um, well, I don't have anything more to uh, raise with regard to this topic. Um, are there any, any final questions? Issues? No, no, no further questions, Michael. All right. uh, when will we have the quiz one marks back? You will have them back as soon as I can get them done. <laughs> no, no, no. That's, look, I think I realistically, I'd say uh, that's 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 a that's a typical cop out response, isn't it? <laughs> um, uh, look, by the end of the week, I'd say. Yep. 
that's my full expectation, really. Yeah. It won't take me that long. I've already started, started the process. Uh, there's not many of you, I know that, but I've got a lot of them doing other things. Yeah, so I'd say by the end of the week. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Grant, good, sir. good. Thank you for those contributions today, people. Um, and um, uh, so, yeah, the quizzes, marks and so forth, they'll be, that'll be tidied up um, fairly soon. And um, then I'll get out the information on quiz two uh, early next week. Uh, and I've indicated to you how that can be done. Uh, and then I will... Um, by week 10, I will post instructions and guidance for the final assessment as well. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we're on track, people. And then we'll, I'm going to just think about how we run um, sort of catch up. We're, we're in, this is doing topic six, but it's week eight. Um, I really would like, if we can, to try and you know, have everything wrapped up by the end of week 11. Um, so that gives you a full week. Um, in terms of finalising and just preparing um, for final assessment in the course. Um, I'll see how I go, um, but that's what I'm trying to. I'll try and aim towards that. Okay. All right. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye.